Um, hello, ladies and gentlemen. I suggest we get started. We have a um, very, uh, very nice panel here, and uh, lots of things to say, lots of things to discuss. So I think we should get started. Um, so um, we're here to discuss the growth and well-being. Better governance? Okay, in Tokyo, okay. So we're basically here um, we're having a, a panel on, um, on um, spatial well-being. Um, the idea is basically, I mean, what we've seen, um, not only in the OCD, but also more generally, is that there's an increased awareness that space matters. I mean, from my own experience, I can tell you 10 years ago, if I talked to my colleagues about space and uh, economics, I mean, they looked like me like I was an alien. I mean, these days that has radically changed. I mean, people are now realizing that, I mean, one-size policies, one-size-fit-all policies um, are not achieving all the goals. I mean, there needs to be something else. And um, that's not least connected to what is often um, resumed under a geography of discontent. I mean, the results of certain elections in certain countries that have made clear that um, prosperity and also prospects, they're not equally distributed across space. There are some places that are not as fortunate as others. And this is creating problems, and even the more because there's some evidence that the gaps have actually been widening. For example, I mean, there's some um, research we've been doing at the OSD, mainly Alexander has been doing that, that's showing that um, um, because, I mean, usually you're supposed to have convergence, economic convergence between regions, but that's actually showing that the uh, most productive regions are the ones who have been actually been um, having the highest growth rates over the last decade. And that really is as worrying in the sense that basically it's not just that you have these um, uh, different prosperity and different prospects, but also apparently, I mean, the gaps are not closing, they're rather widening. And um, then, of course, I mean, this is creating certain dividing lines. I mean, I think the ones between rural and urban is the one that's been most discussed about. But there's also dividing lines within cities. There's rich parts and poor areas in cities. And uh, there's also dividing lines in the sense that some areas are part of the global value chains, are hubs, and others are rather remote, and that may also create problems. Now it's very important to understand these phenomena and to see how we can deal with them. And that's what this panel is supposed to be doing. We'll be looking at three main questions. I mean, the first one is basically what cities and regions can do to promote growth and well-being for everybody. Then the second question, we're going to look at the role of networks and connections, connectedness, and how they can help, on the one hand, to create prosperity, but also mainly to spread prosperity. And then finally, we're going to look at governance issues. How can we ensure that decisions are taken at the right scale? Um, we're going to have like three rounds of questions. Um, all of you panelists um, will have three to five minutes for each of the questions. And then if there's some time in the end, then we have a discussion with the public, if that's okay. Um, before I present the panel, I'd just like to, to thank um, people who have been really uh, crucial in setting up this, this panel. This is Chuk van Dijk, uh, Arjen Eckes, and Alexander Lemke. Oh, I think they're all here in the room, so thank you very much. I mean, without you, I mean, this panel wouldn't have happened. Um, and um, so now, without further ado, just I'd like to introduce, I mean, the, the really, I mean, very um, high-level speakers we're having on this panel here. There's two academics and three policymakers. I'll start with uh, the lady, and then I'll be presenting the gentleman in the order of starting with those who've traveled most, basically, the longest time. So, so I mean, we're having with us uh, Roberto Capello. She's the full professor of regional and urban economics from the Politecno di Milano. Uh, she has a very impressive long list of activities that she's been doing, so I'm not going to tell that all, but I'll just mention that she's also been president of the Regional Sciences Association International. She's been working on a very large number of areas, transport, tourism, special planning, trade, sustainable cities, energy, but one of the main focus has been innovation, and I'm going to ask you also some, some questions specifically on that, just a small warning. And uh, also, among a lot of other tasks, I mean, she's the editor of Papers in Regional Science. And last but not least, she is the winner of this year's Ursa Prize, which we didn't know when we invited her, but we're even more happy to have her, so we get some extra glory for this panel from that, basically. <laughs> then, um, all to my right, 
man named Mark Padridge, who comes, came all the way from the United States for this conference. He's the C. William Swank Chair of Rural Urban Policy at the Ohio State University and Professor in the Agricultural, Environment and Development Economics Department. Um, he is specialized, among many other things, in rural urban dependencies, uh, why certain communities grow faster than others, innovations in regional policy and governance, Again, among many other activities, he is co editor of the Journal of Regional Science. And uh, he has been in the past president of the Southern Regional Science Association, which I didn't mention. I mean, both uh, Roberto and him are having countless publications in all the top journals. And um, if I kind of like, I mean, uh, I tried to print the CV, but I mean, there were almost 50 pages, so I actually just, just <laughs> downloaded them. Then to my right, we're having uh, Tony Lloyd, who comes to us from Manchester. Um, he is the uh, Member of Parliament for Rochdale, which is a part of the Greater Manchester. And he is the former mayor of Greater Manchester, and before that was the Police and Crime Commissioner. He's a very long-standing Member of Parliament, more than 30 years, I calculated. Um, and he has also been Minister for the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office. He has been the leader of the UK delegation to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe and has been chair of the parliamentary section of one of the major parties in the UK. And um, I think that's the main points. Um, then we're having uh, Mark Fricker, all on the left on the other side there, um, who is um, Director General for Mobility and Transport in the Ministry of Infrastructure and the Environment here in the Netherlands. And um, he has a, a very impressive, I mean, record of uh, fields that he's been working in, mainly as a Director General in different uh, ministries here. I'll just give you part of the list, which is mobility, transport, housing, uh, neighborhood policy, integration, energy, um, telecoms and post, and also urban areas. And prior to that, also, he's been working on justice and education. So, I mean, it's like, you know, the, I thought it was, he's a bit like the OCD in one person because the OCD is working on everything but defense, and so that's a bit like that, actually. <laughs> um, then, um, last but not least, we have Josias van Aertsen, who had the, the shortest travel because he's the King Commissioner of Trenton. So, I mean, that was basically a relatively short train ride to come here. But um, before that, um, he has also fulfilled a large number of other functions. Among them, he has been mayor of The Hague. He's been the leader of one of the um, important parties here in uh, the Netherlands. He's been minister for foreign affairs and he's been minister for agricultural, food and, no, agriculture, nature and food quality. And... Um, and he's, I mean, also kind of like, I mean, we did, as may, some of you may know in the room here, we did a study on um, the uh, MRDH, the Rotterdam, the Hague metropolitan region a couple of years ago from the OCD. And so I have a very good uh, relation and uh, also, I mean, um, remembrance at, at that study. And I'll also kind of like, I mean, refer to that experience in the MRDH that you're having. So, uh, but I mean, the point is not that I'm talking, the point is to get the, the panel members talking, so let's start with the first question. And just to remind you, I mean, the first question was basically how can cities and regions promote growth and well-being for all? And, um, and also kind of like a sub-question is kind of like, you know, what are the policies um, that are better located at the city region level rather than the national level? And um, so I would start the first round um, by asking Josias um, to talk about what his experience, because he's been working at the national, the regional, and the municipal level. So, what is his experience in promoting growth and well-being at these different levels, and then, you know, who's best placed to do what? Well, who's best placed to do what? That's an interesting question uh, indeed. Um, but first of all, I, I would like to say. But I, I thought that the idea was as well to say what are in fact the priorities uh, if you look at uh, the, the discussion here these days. Well, the first, the first element I, I want to touch upon is the fact that um, although there is some criticism here in the Netherlands about the European Union from some quarters, 
But if you look at the cohesion funds and the cohesion policies of the European Union, uh, they have been looking at the north of the country, uh, the, the provinces of uh, Groningen, Friesland and uh, Drenthe, have been uh, all over quite successful. If you look at uh, the, uh, the amount of money invested here from the, all the, the funds uh, combined, you're talking about, uh, well, more up and around 200 um, million euros. It uh, is an increase of employment over the last uh, five or six years of nearly more than 7,000 of the, of the workforce. The cities, if you look at uh, the cities of uh, Leeuwarden, Groningen, and, uh, for instance, in, in the city in the south-east uh, of uh, Drenthe, Emmen, all these cities have been upgraded over the past, uh, past uh, year, thanks to money from the side invest and investments from the side of uh, the European Union. And that triggered private investment as well. Uh, I think it's more or less uh, 1 billion uh, Euro, uh, Euro. If you look at the future for, because the North uh, is of course a very important part of the Netherlands, if you look at the economy, and there is sometimes the tendency here to grumble and to say, well, we are more or less lagging behind. Of course there are some problems. But you, uh, in my view, the North should, should look at it more from a positive side. If you look at the, the priorities for, uh, for the future, I think one of the main factors of growth here in the North is everything related to uh, the energy transition. One of the most important discussions, but it should be one of the most important discussions now at the Binnenhof in The Hague discussing uh, the, the change and, and the follow-up of uh, the Paris uh, Agreement. I don't think it is the case. They're discussing all other things for weeks on end, like uh, we have seen in Belgium. But the first is energy transition, everything related to food security and so to the agricultural side of this part of the Netherlands and agribusiness, of course, not only the uh, question of farmers, all related to uh, water technology, very important for, for Friesland, and uh, the whole question of healthy aging, um, related, of course, to the demographical situation of, uh, of the northern, uh, northern Netherlands. And if you allow me, just a few remarks about the whole question of energy uh, transition. In my view, the most strongest element for the future uh, for, for the northern part of, uh, of the country, but uh, maybe the rest of Europe as well, is all related to the hydrogen economy and the possibilities there. There's a very, uh, here in the Northern Netherlands, everybody knows this report from the side of uh, VNO and CB, the, the, uh, the, 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 those who um, promote business in, uh, in the Netherlands. But this report was made by the business community here in the northern part of the Netherlands, by the cities and the three uh, provinces are as well connected and, and that's one of the important issues as well. The research institute and the University of Groningen as well. Because one, one of my, if, if I look at, an, at, uh, at the situation of the northern part of the country at present, one of my worries is that with the extinction, you could say, of the gas extraction here in, uh, in Groningen, all related to knowledge and research will in, in fact vanish as well. And there is a lot of knowledge here in, uh, related to energy here in uh, the northern, uh, northern uh, Netherlands. So that's one of the, uh, one of the possibilities for, uh, for the future. Hydrogen economy. Uh, is important for the chemical industry, is reported 
for the um, link between the largest harbour here in the north, Eemshaven, and the connection Eemshaven, Rotterdam, and Eemshaven, Limburg, in the southern part of the country, where there's a lot of chemical uh, industry, DSM. And the Netherlands have to be very careful not to uh, lose tempo here um, and focus. If you look at developments in the Bundesrepublik Deutschland, if you look at California, if you look at some other parts of Asia, but especially Australia, there you see the importance of this new type of energy. Of course, we need, we still will need for the forthcoming uh, years, well, Mark Falkner is the expert here, in fact, we need, we need, of course, gas, we will need wind, we will need solar, but here is a new possibility if you look at developments in, in the world and, uh, and in Europe. And, well, the best, yeah, maybe, maybe, at the, maybe your third question is maybe in the framework of your third question, maybe I take the possibility then to say something about the level of governments and the importance of um, funding from the side of the European Union in the forthcoming years. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, Tony, what is the UK perspective on this question of you know, how citizen regions can best promote growth and well-being for all? And um, maybe when talking about that, I, I was wondering whether you could also kind of like, because I mean, you've been a member of parliament for a long time, you could also kind of like touch upon the role that I mean, members of parliament can, can play in, in that, uh, you know, the process of, of regional economics. And um, yeah, and that would be very interesting. Okay, okay. I mean, thanks. The, the, uh, I, I think the, the allocation of decision making between national um, regional and local governments it isn't a fundamentally an ideological question, it's a practical question. Some of it turns on the, the capacity for good governance and one of the relatives of my own country, rather sadly, and forgive me for being parochial, I didn't vote to leave the European Union, just for the record. The, um, one of the, the sad things about my own country is that we have a very, we've had historically one of the most centralised systems of governance in, um, let me say, in Western Europe um, over the last, over my, my political lifetime. And this, whilst it's beginning to change, um, one of the problems has been that central government hasn't instinctively trusted um, other um, parts of the governmental system. So that trust equation is very important in this because inevitably central government will be a major allocator of, of funding and actually whether we like it or not, money does drive um, decisions. If I were to give a critique of, um, of UK government, but this, this would apply to other governments as well. One of the things we see across different national governments is um, the capacity for differentiation into government departments, that's natural, but little capacity to reintegrate in terms of the policy form formulation, which is problematic because what that very often has done in the UK has meant that governments will search for remote um, methods of assessing the impact of policy which are not always appropriate to the, the, the problem in hand and I can give you countless examples but let me just say this um, if you look after um, what 70 odd years of the public um, national health service the the life chances of a child born in my own now constituency is probably um, would indicate that they will have more days lost through ill health, they will die probably 10 years younger than the most advantaged people in, in modern Britain. Um, it's not a, a failure of, um, of the competence of the, our health system, it's a failure of the competence of, the, of national planning that, is, that deals well with symptoms and badly with problem specification and problem solution. Because most of the, the if we want to solve problems, it's mainly about recognising these need multi-dimensional, multi-agency approaches. So if, if you want me to say, there are some decisions where government is obviously better if I want somebody to decide what qualifications our nurses have, then the, the national conversation has got to be right. We need a uniformity across the system. Um, uh, as a minister, I have actually been to war. Um, creating the conditions where we go to war. I must say, man, it was a just war. It wasn't Iraq, it was in Kosovo, which I think was a... Um, a um, but the, um, those decisions are obviously national. But decisions actually 
um, around the way in which we allocate resources for localised services, I think are better delivered at local level. And the, the, the proper prescription actually is one uh, of partnership between central government and the, in, in the case of my own the, um, the geographical area of Greater Manchester, um, with, the, with the, the Greater Manchester Combined Authority, um, the, the collection of 10 local authorities. Um, that partnership has to be based on trust and has to be based on a mutual confidence. But if we can have the concept of joint problem specification, if we can have the capacity to co-design the way in, in which we will build um, the systems of solution, then localism is better actually in creating the delivery mechanism. Um, so I'm an instinctive devolutionist, but not an ideological one. Um, uh, the, the, one of the issues that we face in my country, frankly, if central government doesn't trust local government, it has underfunded local government. Because it underfunds local government, local government tends to respond to crisis rather than to rational planning. And one of the consequences of that is that local government itself has withdrawn capacity from areas where it needs both intellectual competence and sometimes, if you like, historic memory. Now, those things do matter. So, in the case of modern Britain, we do actually, in the end, um, need an asymmetric series of solutions. The, what is good for my own city region isn't necessarily good even for another city region um, 50 miles away, and uh, even less for um, a much more rural area. There may be different uh, policy prescriptions, different relationships with central government there. In terms of the role of, of members of parliament, I mean, obviously one of the important roles, frankly, is advocacy. Um, uh, I am an advocate for my constituents primarily, but obviously for my uh, city region, for my, for my larger region, for, in my case, the north of England. Um, uh, it may shock you to know that the English don't regard each other as being always equal. The south of England thinks we're um, primitive and we think they're at the feet. But that's, um, that's a local uh, issue that you know, didn't, needn't all detain on. Um, but what that does mean is that the advocacy role for members of parliament is important. And I just want, I'll finish on this. If you would take... Um, we'll talk about infrastructure a little bit later on, though, but if you were to take a question around infrastructure, um, at the moment there is a debate taking place in Britain because the present government has just authorised um, a rail scheme, maybe necessary, if, which will cost £30 billion UK pounds, um, across London. London has a population of around about 11 million. The north of England has a population which is half as big again. Um, the spending in this parliament on rail um, infrastructure in the north of England will be 13 billion, so actually less than half for um, a much bigger population. And in fact, failure of decision-making at the national level and the inability of the national government to create um, the, if you like, the, 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 um, the mechanics of assessment um, that is, makes it very difficult. And that's where the, the advocacy role of members of parliament has got to be a part of a real issue. I can go on at many other levels. One final point I would just make is this. There is a word I shall return to, but really good to save you telling me I've used my time. Actually, building partnership across the different agencies is much easier at the city region level of three million people with the private sector, with the voluntary sector, with the educational system, whatever it may be, than it is for national government. It, when national government builds partnership, it does it in a very lumpy and incompetent way. Um, uh, um, so if you want to engage um, people across the piece, actually that sense of localism is a really important part of, of, the, of delivering dynamic change. Okay, well, thank you very much, um, Tony. That's been very interesting to hear. Um, I would now like to turn to, to Mark. Mark on this side. <coughs> no, no, this one. <laughs> and um, ask you, because, I mean, I mean, you have, a, as I mentioned before, you have a huge amount of experience in a lot of different fields at the national level. And so I was wondering, I mean, obviously, I mean, um, in addition to our general question we're having, but if you could also touch on you know the areas where you think that kind of like you know guidance from the national level is most important and which are the areas where you think that maybe the national level is sometimes a bit like you know over active let's put it this way 
Oh boy. Let me first say it's, it's, it's a pleasure to be in this, uh, this room. This is the place where I finished my study. Uh, and all things that I'm telling that are, are not right, it's the fault of the faculty that is organizing this meeting. Of course. Uh, having said that, I was pleased uh, with the paper we got before the, this panel that states place matters uh, and uh, be aware uh, for space blind policy. And uh, that's what I have been doing uh, all my, uh, my career. Uh, that's my starting point. What we got, not only in the Netherlands, uh, but looking around uh, in, in other countries, that we end up with, is this an issue to decentralize or not? And what I have tried to do in my uh, activities is uh, not to do that. For, I think it's, it's a mistake, uh, even stupid to do that. For example, I, I was responsible for urban policy in uh, my former uh, period. And uh, we, we were more or less stuck at a national level. Can we be engaged in urban development at a national level, given the fact that we have decentralized our spatial policy? And I thought, this is so stupid, it can't be the answer. So what we did uh, with the OECD, with the European Union, with people at a local and a regional level, we said, okay, let's join forces. What is important for you? What is important for me? And then you, you join forces, and of course you end up, what has already been said, a multi-level approach, uh, a multi-stakeholder approach, and that's not a complex issue. I'm interested, what is of interest, for example, for Josias, at a regional level or at a local level in the city of Groningen. So, for example, take the bikes up front. I can state I'm not responsible at a national level for biking policy, for it's a, a, a local issue. But given the fact that uh, almost 50% of the people that are entering in railway station and using the train are coming by bike and they want to park their, their bike uh, at the train station, we can't end up telling the local government, okay, that's your problem and we will see after that. So we joined forces, and we did that with the urban agenda, for example. So please, let's not make the mistake that has been made, certainly uh, in, the, in the field of policy and also of politicians, that it's either local or either national. It's also stupid that at a national level, or at a European level, the idea is we know better what is at stake at a local level. That's even more stupid. That's one thing I, I want to, to point I want to make. The second one uh, for you asking what, what can regions and, and cities do? Uh, let me use the, the swimming pool uh, uh, metaphor. We had uh, certainly in this region a decline of inhabitants. And uh, we ended up with a policy at a local level that every mayor or city was deciding let's build a swimming pool. For, that's making my village or my city much more attractive. attractive. The interesting uh, uh, experience was it, it was not only in place A, but also in place B and place C. And we ended up with a lot of swimming pools that were not efficient and, and maintainable. So I'm using the phrase of my, my MP, who was uh, in a former period working for Unilever, and he told a group of top civil servants among uh, myself, he said, I learned that I'm not working on, if you are a four or five in terms of developments, and try to make it a five or a six, but if you are a six or a seven, try to make it an eight or a nine. So use your strengths and your possibilities, and that's also an issue uh, up north. Those of us was looking for it, and I agree, energy is one of them. So if you don't be aware of your strong points, you end up with even more <coughs> difficulties than you had before. My main law is, the main reason for uh, problems are solutions. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, well, thanks, uh, Mark, for your um, um, slightly unexpected but very interesting <laughs> intervention. Um, so now we are turning to the other Mark. And uh, I was wondering whether you could tell us a bit, you know, about the US perspective. and. Um, yeah, kind of like, you know, also kind of like focus a bit on the, you know, the geography of discontent and the, um, the geography of American poverty that you've been written a lot about. Oh, well, thank you. First, uh, thank you for inviting me for this uh, panel. Uh, 
I, I'm, uh, as was noted, uh, I'm the uh, managing editor of the journal Regional Science, and it relates to this is that uh, though it's not been a major area of my research, I think one of the key, you know, one of the things that I believe, really strongly believe, now with the help of my uh, one of my former Canadian colleagues, Rose Olford, that if you get governance wrong, everything else is just going to fail. Uh, and so, you know, I'll, I'll talk about that in terms of examples. And, and then thus, you know, because of that, we, you know, I've tried to shepherd through papers that if they could make a good international case, you know, it could be a case study of the Netherlands or what have you, that issues of governance and how to do it correctly are, are, are things of, you know, inherent importance to regional science. Uh, <clears throat> but in terms of the U.S. perspective, where I think the U.S. provides the extreme of, of a lot of local governance, uh, is that, uh, for example, I come from a metropolitan area, Columbus, Ohio, of about two million people. We have about 200 place-based uh, administrative units, whether towns, villages, uh, surrounding the major city of Columbus of about 850,000 people. And so I live in a suburb, about 150 meters away is the city of Columbus. And the reason why I live in my suburb, this is the advantage of having a lot of local governments, TiVo sorting, is that I wanted great schools, I want, I want a great police department, I want services, and I'm willing to pay for it. I mean, my taxes are, are, are quite high. However, the however to that is, is that we have a lot of local government, and they all compete with one another. And, and perhaps later I might talk about some of the ways that, because of that, it drives down our aggregate well-being. And this would be across the United States, that too much government, all competing with one another, though benefits because you have more voice, I have, I have great schools and everything, but instead we're bringing us all down. Uh, so and that's, that's, that's one of the reasons why I'm interested in that, is that from the U.S. perspective, I'm not sure exactly what the right level is, and, that's, and I think that, you know, in the sense that different institutional settings really matters. However, I can assure you we have too much. We just have way too much. And indeed, you know, the reason why I say good governance is so important is that I think at a conference like this, I hear a lot about, you know, we have to have more education, human capital, technology. We have to have better environmental policies because the way you destroy your place's long-run viability is destroy the environment. Energy policies. Well, we can't get there without good governance. I mean, basically, in every society, uh, elites, by using that term, I mean elites that actually have power, not elites that can count to ten. But you'd be accused of in the United States if you have high education. I mean, people who actually have power. You know, elites will capture things if there's bad institutions. They will capture it to their own benefit. And, and it'll promote rent seeking. It promotes income inequality. The kinds of geography of despair that you, know, you have pockets throughout that are just lagging. Bad governance is one of the causes of that. And so when bringing up the, you know, the issue that came up and hasn't been mentioned yet is these space-blind policies. Let's treat everybody equally and allow the market system to work its way through. And, and of course, such a situation would work very, very well. If you have perfect mobility of capital and labor, migration gone, there is no reason for place-based policy. Government will only make it worse. But there's nowhere that I'm ever aware of, maybe a glorious short period in the late 20th century in the United States, that, that labor, people just don't move like that, including in the United States. And thus, we, we got to start thinking about place-based policy. I mean, I can go on about all the inefficiencies of place-based policy. However, there are definite needs. If people don't move to economic opportunity, we have to bring it to them. And so, and the final argument is, is politicians are inherently place-based. They're elected from a place. We're going to have place-based policy. Thus, how do we make it better? How can we make it better and serve the people that need to be served? Uh, so in that, I, I just want to you know, tout some work that was done at OECD, including uh, uh, the moderator was one of the co-authors, is that one of the papers we published, I'm very proud of it, I'm very proud of it, that we published this paper, is that a very difficult paper, was they were showing across the entire OECD, which is a very difficult data issue, uh, of showing how more fragmented governance at the local and regional level led to lower, ec worse economic outcomes. And, and, you know, they weren't able, you know, I mean, there's a reduced form model, we could talk about why, how far we can push it. However, I think it does a very good job of saying, hey, we're probably, in most places in the world, beyond the threshold where we have too much. You know, what, you know how, how do we rein that in? 
And, and in that, you know, we can talk about, you know, this panel has people much more experienced than me about how unwinding inefficient, too much governance, trying to build more coherent governance that reflects you know, the modern era of instead of horse and buggy where you, you couldn't communicate or transport or this era where we're integrated in massive regions. We live and work in the same massive regions. We shop and so on. How do we make those regions work better? And so I think, the, you know, as we'll talk about, I think one of the key questions beyond is within each institutional setting. The U.S. has its own constitution. Uh, you know, each European Union country has their own uh, uh, setting, institutional setting, and so on, across Asia and so on. How within each of those institutional settings, with different relationships between the, the central government and local and regional governments, how do we actually make the right form of governance? Because I know the solution for the United States is not the solution for the EU and so on. So I, I think, uh, you know, on that I'll, I'll stop there, but, you know, identifying these kinds of tipping points I think are first, really first order kinds of questions to get at the kind of policies that we actually talk more about, like neat innovation policies and so on. Okay, I mean, um, that actually was a brilliant uh, lead over because I was going to, to ask Roberta now to talk about innovation policies, specifically when talking about kind of like what kind of like, you know, well, the regional policies can have and um, also kind of like, you know, you were talking about collective learning, local assets and then about these aspects that would be really interesting, I think. Thank you very much and uh, thank you also from my side for the invitation to this panel. Uh, well, innovation policies are uh, policies where we um, um, practice uh, smart specialization. Uh, so we moved from, as, as a European policy, we moved from the space blind to the place-based policy. And I think that it has a, a, a big importance uh, in moving in that direction, especially in the field in, of innovation, because we were used to think about innovation policies only as R&D support. If we wanted to have a region innovating more, policymakers were thinking of uh, producing uh, a new R&D laboratory or giving more R&D uh, funds to already existing uh, small laboratories. So it was a matter of giving money and support to uh, creating new knowledge. And we had, and we still have, a lot of examples of failures of this kind of policy, especially in backward regions. Even in Italy, where country I come from, uh, we gave the south of Italy a lot of money to create R&D laboratories that are what we call white <laughs> elephant. Uh, so they did not really produce any kind of uh, um, uh, learning and uh, uh, interactive activities with the firms that are located there. So we moved to the place-based policy and we said, okay, that's, that's the way out. So we will have uh, regions coming up with their solutions and say what they really want uh, to do with the money that Europe can produce, can give uh, to innovation policies. And from the theoretical point of view, I totally agree that this is the way, in the sense that each region uh, develops its own mode of innovation. So innovation is not, does, does not have to be equated to knowledge, so we knowledge, as it was said before, can be produced and not be developed into commercialized activity. So if you have an in, uh, a, the creation of, no, of knowledge, this doesn't mean that it leads immediately to innovation. But and if it does, it, what you capture is technological innovation. Uh, you can have many other ways in which regions can innovate, marketing innovation, organizational innovation, the process innovation, or whatever. Uh, but also the way in which this innovation is developed can be uh, due to the fact that a region is able to grasp knowledge that comes outside. So there is no need for a region to have all the uh, steps from creating a new idea up to the commercialization of the idea. It can grasp ideas from outside and produce its own innovation. Okay, so we are happy with it. But then we come to the first 
uh, step of the evaluation of the smart specialization strategy. And if you look into the official documents, you find out that, for example, again, the, the example comes from the country I come from, we have seven regions belonging to, to the south of Italy, so our backward area, and five of them declared that they are specialized in nanotechnologies. So can we believe that? No. So there is something that hasn't worked properly there, because if a region like Calabria, eh, so the just last, the last one, uh, before Sicily, huh? in front of Sicily, <laughs> declares that its future is in nanotechnology, uh, we, I don't know whether we have, if we did a step forward <laughs> with respect to the R&D activity. So my point here, which was developed uh, in, uh, in our uh, research activities in Italy, is that probably in the smart specialization strategy, there is something missing. In the sense that you can give local actors and local policy makers the right to say which product, projects they want to develop. Eh? Uh, but within a framework eh, of activities and of programs that have to be tailored on their innovative capacity and innovative mode, uh, uh, which is something that sometimes, because they want to show up that they are uh, uh, on the top frontier of that, they forget. So uh, Calabria cannot, let's say, develop its innovation activities on a science-based approach. It should be more on an imitative, creative and imitative uh, uh, thinking and uh, process uh, of innovation or an application, a very bright creative application. But not th this is not because of the advantage of the EU or of the Italian uh, government, but of the advantage of the local people and the local actors that are in the backward regions, that are located in the backward regions. Thank you. Sorry, so I, I totally agree with my colleague here saying that there is a balance, and there has to be a balance between local and national uh, policymakers. Okay, I mean, thanks for I mean, um, and sharing these uh, very interesting uh, insights about uh, how um, smart specialization works, works in practice. That um, I thought that we had been moved beyond the stage where kind of like everybody wanted to do the latest uh, near high tech fed, but apparently we were still in, in that phase somehow. Um, so we are, we are now moving to the um, the second question, and uh, so the second round will be talking about connectedness and, and networks in general. So the idea is kind of like to, to, to think about, explore how physical, but not only physical, but also institutional connections and network, networks more generally, how they are creating prosperity, but also how they help to spread the benefits of prosperity and to achieve that we, there's access to opportunities for everybody. And um, this time I would like to start with Mark on my right side and um, ask you, I mean, um, when are cities engines of growth and kind of like, you know, we talk maybe a bit about acceleration benefits, acceleration shadows, and also maybe about the hierarchy of cities and, um, and also rural um, linkages because, I mean, that's also something you have a very, um, I mean, you're very much specialized in. Well, thank you. I think the, the premise of the question, from my point of view, is just right on. Uh, I do a lot of, in my day job, I do a lot of rural development work. I've been doing that for about 15 years. And, and, I, and I can, is it one of the things, is that especially that I'm in an audience where there's a lot of people from ur, you know, urban areas, and, uh, you know, they kind of, you know, that's rural, who cares? You know, and, and uh, you know, there, there are real costs to ignoring rural areas. One of the unintended consequences is certain election outcomes may not go the way that you would have expected if you ignore rural areas and they feel like uh, they're not getting their voice heard. Uh, so, you know, in terms of, you know, so the point is if you ignore rural areas, there's some extreme political economy costs. And, and so, you know, some people, uh, who cares? That, that, that's costly. Uh, so, but when, I, when, I, when we talk about rural development policy, you know, if you, unless you're a high amenity rural area, it is really hard 
to come up with some sort of reasonable economic development strategy. Just really hard. As, uh, as Roberta noted earlier, you know, a high technology plan for a relatively rural region is, is, is just an utter waste. It's, it's, it's silly. Uh, you know, so wh how, what would be the best strategy? And I, and I tend to argue that, well, the best led strategy of rural development is urban led growth. And by that, I don't mean the 2009 uh, World Bank Development Report where it, you know, basically it was arguing it was quasi-spatial blind, but in effect it was all resources should go to the largest cities, thereby you know, they have higher agglomeration, there's higher productivity, uh, people will move there, everything will be fine. I've already talked about the problems of expecting everybody to move there. But you know, in terms of studying this, uh, one of the things I find, like looking at North America, looking at China and so on, is growth of the largest cities tend to come at the expense of the rest of the country. You know, the most talented people, financial resources are sucked out, all the infrastructure spending is going there, and it tends to be at the expense of the rest of the country. Well, on the other hand, small and medium-sized cities are actually, at least in the OECD world, are the fastest growing, which has been pointed out many times. But in terms of rural development, they play a different role. And unlike the largest cities, which I'm not saying that they don't play their important role in the urban system, but unlike the largest cities, their growth tends to spread out more. It, because there's less congestion, you create more commuting opportunities. Because there's less congestion, you can create more opportunities for supply chain linkages between small and intermediate sized cities and the rural countryside. And thus, it, it is, you know, in that sense, these kinds of cities could really play an important role in rural development. And of course, then comes the question, actually do that, you have to have the right governance arrangement to do that. So, uh, you know, I'm very much in favor of urban-led growth because it'd be very important for the rural areas, keeping in mind that it's not putting it all in, in particular areas. But also, rural development needs to face the fact that certain things are not going to happen in rural areas, thus there's a need for realism. And one of the more realistic ways is what, what was called borrowing agglomeration economies, trying to link up with urban areas who can help facilitate you know, areas that you're missing in agglomeration. And as was noted in the question, you know, infrastructure plays a really key role in, in that. You have to have the right infrastructure in terms of roads. I found out over my years of experience what surprised me, what surprised me uh, 25 years ago is the role of water infrastructure, that, that it's, in larger urban-centered regions, it's usually one city or one municipality have control over the water, and thus, you know, they try to take advantage of that. How, how, you know, these kinds of things should be worked out in a more equitable regional manner. But, but unlike, uh, I think the premise of the question in terms of focusing on the expenditure side, you know, how do we make these expenditures, I think a, a tougher problem is on the taxation side. In other words, that's where somebody, if you want regional solutions, that's where people have to see power, is that every, every politician, and I'd get it, if I was a politician, I do not want to give up my power. However, if we actually want regional solutions, we need to find ways of tax sharing. And, and, and finding ways of collecting the taxes at a regional level to help ensure that the benefits and costs are somewhat equally spread throughout the region and not just, you know, just centered on a particular area. Like in North America, it's too often building up really nice downtowns that have great condos, but not helping the neighborhoods. You know, so how do we, how do we ensure that this is more spread out? And, in, and I'll just give one U.S. example you know, where how you do not do it. I used to joke when I said, everybody, come to Ohio. Look at Ohio, how we do things. Go back to your country and place and do it exactly the opposite. You have so much to learn from us. And, and one of the things that we have is, is that every little municipality can collect their own income tax, which, you know, it, it seems like, oh, yeah, that's egalitarian and everything. It creates incredible problems in practice in that Every municipality now has an incentive to steal from their neighboring municipality some business. In other words, as I say, just getting the Walmart to move across the street. We haven't created any wealth. However, tax incentives were used. We've created all sorts. We've ruined the fiscal health of the region without creating any economic wealth in re return for that. And thus, uh, you know, these kinds of silly governance arrangements with all the unintended consequences need to be avoided. And that's one of the reasons why I say on the expenditure side, I'm sorry, on the revenue side, making sure that there's, you know, instead of having a, a little municipality collecting, say, an income tax, the entire region does so that everybody's part of that. And you get rid of these bad incentives to steal from one another, start thinking more like a region instead of a little place within a broader uh, urban region. So, 
I, I think in terms of rural development is, is urban-led growth, providing the kind of institutions that rural areas don't feel like they're going to be overwhelmed by the city, that they're going to equally benefit, I think is key to moving forward in terms of, uh, in terms of realistic uh, rural-led growth, or rural growth. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Um, so we have all learn from uh, Ohio. Um, Mark, um, on the left side. Um, I was wondering whether you could, um, I mean, in answering the question, I mean, um, have a bit of look on, on infrastructure and, uh, and also transport infrastructure and what role it plays, you know, for, for connectedness and what the views on those things are. Thank you very much. I've worked in different fields eh? and was always frustrated by my colleagues who were responsible for transport and infrastructure who were quite arrogant telling me it starts with infrastructure. So here I am. What we noticed, and I, I, we take for example uh, Amsterdam, if you know the city, the northern part of Amsterdam was rather under, underdeveloped. And even the announcement that there would be a, a metro line from north to south was speeding up all connections to the northern part of, uh, of Amsterdam. In Rotterdam, we had the, the different experience. Uh, the southern part of uh, Rotterdam was rather underdeveloped compared to the northern part. But the moment they started to build bridges, or we started to build bridges, it was improving. That's not the end, but it's helping. We had a discussion in the, in the north, and if I got the information also during this conference, uh, we need a high-speed train connection from Amsterdam to, uh, to Rotterdam. It, it was a plan, and it was never achieved. To Groningen. Groningen, sorry. The other one is as important as well. <laughs> <laughs> You're quite right. Sorry for that. <laughs> And, and we had a debate uh, in, in the north, uh, we need the high-speed train. And I think it's wise for you get much more opportunities. Look, for example, for another city in the, in the, in the Netherlands, Solle, at the crossroads of infrastructure, and it's really in helping to improve, attracting students, uh, giving more facilities, like the city of Groningen is uh, having uh, as well. But the moment you can't achieve, you, it's almost as, as if the whole policy is falling down. So it's not all about uh, uh, infrastructure. It's important. But if you don't have a plan what you can do with infrastructure, it's not a big plan. It is not a well plan. So what, what I do hope that make clever use of, uh, of the, the possibilities of transport and infrastructure. Uh, I think it's absolutely helpful to, to develop. Uh, we noticed in terms of economic development, of course, I think in the whole audience, that uh, at an at a urban level, you have more opportunities for growth than at the regional and uh, uh, outside the urban area. But there are, is absolutely a scale. And if the transport difficulties, for example, take uh, London, are uh, uh, going up, it's becoming a complex issue as well. And that's what I was meant, trying to explain. Uh, every problem is, starts with a solution. So if you concentrate people, you have a new problem as well. But we noticed that the importance of uh, a good infrastructure and uh, a working infrastructure is crucial for uh, development. And that's what's happening. But perhaps the Yoshias can tell a little bit more about the, the, the institutional cooperation between The Hague and Rotterdam. It's about people, it's about institutions, and it's about connections in a physical way. And you need the two. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, Roberta, now we, all, we talked about, I mean, roads and um, infrastructure. Um, you've been doing a lot of work on uh, telecoms and computer networks. So um, how important can they be, you know, for this kind of connectedness? And can they kind of like, you know, in places where you don't have enough population density to get real acclimation, physical acclimation benefits. Can you get virtual acclimation benefits with new technologies? Okay, thank you very much. Well, um, the reply is uh, no. Um, in the sense that uh, these technologies, um, telecommunication and uh, information technologies, they can help uh, the connection. Uh, now, 
we have no longer a problem of, the, um, of connecting backward regions to, they are all connected. The problem is the way in which these uh, uh, technologies are used in a strategic way. And this is where uh, backward regions still have uh, a lot uh, to, to, do, to develop. Um, the way in which uh, these technologies can be strategic for the achievement of new markets, of new activities, new businesses, uh, this is something that is not uh, simple. Uh, to, to, to be developed, and this is where uh, regional uh, regions, backward regions, are still uh, lagging behind. Uh, so we again, we do not have to give um, to make the, the mistake that connecting them is the solution. Uh, connecting them is the pre preconditions in order for them to compete. But then. Uh, also in terms of especially policy makers and so on, they have, and local policy makers, they have to help uh, local firms, local actors to, to develop a knowledge, to develop a way in which these technologies can be strategic for, their, for the business of uh, firms that are there. And this is something, again, that, is not, that has not to be given for granted. Um, Another point is that it happened also for transport infrastructures. Uh, we made the same mistake with transport infrastructure at the beginning of the 50s when, for example, in Italy we built the motorways uh, uh, between the north and the south of Italy, uh, thinking that this would, would have been the solution of the problem of our south of Italy. And if you look into the accounts, the trade inter-regional trade accounts in that period, you find out that after the, the, the establishment of the motorway, the south of Italy uh, became even more a net importer of goods from the north uh, than it was before. And this was due to the fact that thanks to the motorway, we had we made uh, our, the, the, the strongest part of the, of the country be able to achieve much quicker a, a, a market, a large market in the south of Italy. So again, there are, I'm not saying that we should not have done these types of, of policies, but this should not have been seen as the solution to the problem, but the preconditions in order to build other policies, uh, other uh, connected policies to develop the, the, the backward regions. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, Tony, and just to touch on a totally different aspect of, of connectedness, I mean, when we're talking about security, about crime, I mean, then sometimes, you know, when something happens, then one, one agent is saying, oh, it wasn't our fault because, I mean, we couldn't go, go there because the neighbors didn't do it or whatever. I mean, there's a lot of finger pointing at somebody else's responsibility. And so, I mean, it seems collaboration, but also kind of like being connected seems to be really important. I mean, what is your experience on that side? Sure. Can, can, can we pick up that actually from uh, where Roberta hmm? left off? Because I, I absolutely agree with, with this. We have um, a debate in Britain at the moment about the, the development of a high-speed rail link from, it, well, essentially because it's uh, planned by people in London from London to the north of England, to my own city region, to... Uh, um, the other side to the lead city region and such like. And this, this is a, an ambition, is a good thing, I support this. But of course, the reality is this, if that is the only thing we do, what we will do is deprive lots of intermediary locations of access to high-speed rail. Because high-speed rail, almost by its nature, can only go to a limited number of places. Um, so you, you need to give people access to the connectivity. It isn't just a question of being of having systems of connectivity, you need access to that. And I'm very conscious of the fact that if you look at a city like my own city, the central of my own city region, Manchester is probably now the second financial um, uh, capital in, after London in the United Kingdom. Much smaller, but nevertheless important. If you were to look at people who live less than half a kilometre away, they have absolutely no access to the investment or the employment base that was created by that, 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 that those, those new uh, 
uh, new institutions. So it's actually more than about um, systems of connectivity. It is about the capacity to access um, that connectivity that, that becomes fundamental. And I'll give you an illustration, actually, because it depends what we're trying to achieve. If it's simply to see investment, um, that may or may not achieve something, but um, uh, um, we can build a, um, the, you know, the, the Hoover Dam. Um, it creates employment, but it's also, in the end, doesn't, to create, doesn't answer every, every, every problem. Um, if, if we're trying to do something that's specific, if you're going to say, well, this is something of a proxy, for example, for creating an employment base. If you talk my own city region, there are something of the order of 250 local government um, wards, the, the basic democratic building block. Of those, only less than 40 um, uh, account for Greater Manchester's unemployment deficit, by which I mean if you measure Greater Manchester against um, the, the, the national average or against the, the, the London and the South East, those 40, um, so one sixth of the geographical area, are the overwhelming, um, have the overwhelming impact of dragging us down, which of course means welfare um, payment transfer into my city region. It means that those the, the, that resource can't be used for you know, for other infrastructure investments, education, and, and, and such like. So, if if if, the, if we're trying to address issues like the employment base, then we have to do something about the employability of those there, so they can access the jobs, so they can access the transport systems, get them into that that work. So, yes, we need local connectivity, but we need access to that. And actually, in that sense, we need. Um, uh, labour market policies, but those labour market policies as well um, are not normally credibly delivered in my own country by national government. That's not a critique. They're done best when national government co-designs with local delivery to agree what it is we're trying to achieve. Um, and there's some very simple things. You know, there, there's a large um, immigrant Somalian population in Greater Manchester. Um, unusually, uh, in one sense, many of these households because of the civil war in Somalia, uh, headed by women. A lot of those women don't speak English. Um, now, if we to get those women into the labour market, then we have to do some very basic things. Which So, however good the transport system is, however good the, um, the, the, the uh, high-speed Wi-Fi is, um, we're not going to make any difference to those women unless we have something active that allows them to begin to access um, the the labour market to begin to become economically productive. So it depends what the problem is that we're specifying as to what the solution is. So, Roberto, you're absolutely right. On, on um, the uh, connectivity, I mean, we, we actually, um, in policing in the UK, we're probably a little different to everybody else. Um, uh, simply, we, whilst we have no national police force, we have re um, localised police um, systems, um, nevertheless, there is, a, the, there is built in a, a, a level of connectivity between those different institutions. And that, by the way, is something else. If, you, if you're looking at um, agglomeration, one of the, this isn't the only reason. One of the reasons why we, we now see the role of the cities in, um, in terms of agglomeration economics is because of human connectivity. This isn't simply um, about my ability to get on a, a fast uh, train or whatever. It's because I know Mark. And Mark knows me, and I know when Mark is useful for my business, for my institution, for whatever it might be. He, in turn, knows that where I'm useful to him. And it's that human um, connectivity that we also have to begin to look at, because it's in the end, it's about um, professional um, and intellectual trust um, that allows us to build the kind of partnerships that allow those agglomeration um, uh, um, effects to kick in. Probably didn't answer your question. Oh, well, a little bit. Anyway, um, thanks a lot. Um, now, um, last but not least, Josias, um, to you. Um, I mean, as I already mentioned, I mean, you're the, the former mayor of The Hague, and uh, you're having this, this, this really exciting experience of the creation of the MRDH there, which is basically about connecting municipalities. Um, which was very largely, I mean, an initiative from, from the local level, so, which is relatively rare. I mean, most of the time this is something which the national government kind of like, you know, uh, forces people to do and then often it doesn't work very well. I mean, so in your case it was, a, I mean, um, an initiative from the bottom up and, and maybe you can 
you know, give us some experience how you know how best to to go about when, about creating connectivity between municipalities to be able to do these initiatives. Just do it. <laughs> I think that's uh, that's the best way to uh, to tackle uh, the problem. Uh, it was it, when when I uh, became mayor of the Hague in um, uh, 2008, the relationship and the connection between Rotterdam and the Hague was a uh, well in an embryonic, um, embryonic uh, stage. Uh, of course, there was a was a connection, but mostly uh, in on a competitive uh, in a competitive manner, and the two. Uh, cities so close to each other in a very densely populated part of, of the Netherlands had to work together to keep, to be quite simple, green what was green uh, in and around uh, the cities. And uh, the importance was better connections between Rotterdam and The Hague, although I've always pleaded for uh, a new form of well, high speed between the four important cities in the Netherlands. We have an if you look at the Randstad, we have an enormous problem. Now the economy is uh, again in the increase and uh, things are going quite well. The enormous problem of uh, uh, transport in the western part of the country is unbelievable. Um, many uh, larger businesses in the western part of the Netherlands told us, the, the mayor of Rotterdam and in the period I was mayor of The Hague, to me, we are worried about the moment the economy will speed up again uh, and does our labour force come on time uh, or will they endlessly um, uh, stuck up in, um, in long lines uh, around, the, around the cities. The Netherlands has always been quite slow to, uh, to implement uh, a new form of transport. We, we're ju just doing patchwork activities, although Rotterdam and The Hague have an, a, important, a good metro system now, nowadays. But the same you know, applies more or less for the northern part of the country. And I heard that the, um, the high-speed train was at some stages uh, this, today uh, discussed. I am uh, in favor of a high-speed connection between Amsterdam, Rotterdam, The Hague and Utrecht and the northern part of the country. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I'm, I, I have some expertise now traveling from the Hague to uh, the northern part of, uh, of the country. And many of you know it, it's, uh, it's a long journey. Uh, it's great. And I'm, I'm quite in favor of uh, Dutch Railway, always very much criticized as well, but they do their utmost, I think. But I think we really need, and, and if you look at the, the possibilities of the North, I, I told you about uh, the priorities here, then you need a better connection between the Randstad and the North. And the rest of what's, what's adjacent to the northern part of, of the northern region, that is Germany and Wilhelmshaven and, and of course Hamburg. So we have to invest in it. And I was very happy that I heard that um, the um, uh, uh, Pim van Ballekom the uh, European Investment Bank um, uh, man, or I don't know what his exact title at, at the moment, Director General or whatever, but he said it is a vice president. Oh, I thought he was already president. <laughs> no, he, he is, this is a viable, economically viable option. And of course there has to be return on investment that is rightly put by, uh, by uh, the, the Vice President. But I'm sure there are many possibilities. If you look at the enormous possibilities here and the importance of a quick connection between the north and the western part of, uh, of the country. It has been debated for years on end, 20 years I think, and there was never real Progress and it's, it's really it's really a pity and very important I think uh, well you discussed it more or less as well but very important for the northern part of the country 
is um, a, dig a digital highway. You don't invest in business here, in a business here in the northern part of, of the country, if the internet is very slow. If you're a farmer, you have a problem. If you're opening a small business here, you have a problem. So that's another other question that has to be tackled uh, in the Netherlands. Um, well, thanks very much as well. Um, we are now, well, we have well, we're running a bit out of time, but I'd still like to, I mean, go for the third round. We're talking about the, the, um, the right scale. I mean, um, the, the, the problem here is, just to explain a little bit, is that the administrative boundaries that we're having in, in Europe and many countries are boundaries that are dating from a long time back. I mean, maybe, I mean, those of you who know France, then in France you have the departements. And uh, they're actually dating back to Napoleon, and Napoleon created them at the time because he was saying kind of like everybody should be able to ride on horseback from where he lives to the central town where my administration is in the morning and do whatever he needs to do and get back in the evening. That was really very smart at the time, but I mean we're still having these boundaries. You know, we invented kind of like, I mean, I mean the motorbike, the car and the internet, but we're still having the same boundaries at the time. And when you're looking at the cities, it's very much the same. I mean, very often, kind of like, I mean, city boundaries reflect the size of cities like 100 years ago or something like that. And so, I mean, this is a real problem that we haven't adapted to that. Now there's, um, we've been doing some work on that in the city. I mean, there's no increased, I mean, recognition of that problem. There's a certain amount of reform initiatives uh, all over the, the world, basically. But I mean, the, the really, the issue that I want to discuss is basically how can we make sure that decisions are taken at the right scale, which is obviously connected to, you know, the, the, the boundaries, administrative boundaries you have, and what governance arrangements are really important. And um, I would like to give the floor first to, uh, to Tony, because, I mean, as you probably all know, I mean, um, I mean Manchester has been really um, a very interesting example in the United Kingdom. Um, because they came, became you know, the Greater Manchester, they had the, the first city deal, and I just, I mean, wanted to hear from from experience of, of this um, of these developments and um, what worked well in this process, and we can be an example for other countries, and maybe also what other things that may not be imitated by others. Sure. I mean, look, let, let, it's something actually that uh, Mark described before in the United States, but I suspect it's something that could be described in most countries around the world, where we could be, it, the if you go back in my own city region uh, 25 years ago, what I would, 10 local authorities, um, they would have arm wrestled each other even for uh, the litter on the street um, because that was the nature of it. We built tribal fiefdoms. And there's something else as well in the UK case that that coincided with the time when central government was probably taking power away from local government, decision-making power and resources. And one of the realities of life is that if you give me a job or a title and you give me some opportunity to interfere, I will interfere in your life. Um, now, I may interfere in a trivial way, but if I can... If, uh, so if we create institutions with maybe not enough um, resource to perform a, a, a competent function, um, we create rivalries and we, we, we create um, problems. And some of that actually was began to be recognised by people across Greater Manchester. And the, there were various reasons why um, 20 years ago the 10 local authorities began to work together. Um, some, some functions have been um, left off from a previous system of governance, which I won't detain. And, but very slowly there was a realisation that these historic rivalries were, um, were, 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 were massively damaging. Now, it's quite good because... There were times when, really, they, they, they had cost um, in, in, in exactly the way that you heard before, the cost uh, um, resources that we fought over um, things that were, that were not in zero sum, but actually negative for everybody. Um, so that recognition that the, the whole um, working together could be bigger than the sum of the parts was, was quite an important step. But one of the big things, in fact, in this was the development of um, some human trust. And this issue of trust, actually, I think is fundamental in, uh, in, the, in, in political systems because it's also um, at least a precursor to the competence of good governance that we've, you've, you've heard people talking about. Um, so we need good governance, but we need um, good governance to work with 
its partners, and its partners may be um, neighbouring polities, but also obviously the, the, the private sector. The, um, uh, one of the interesting things in my own city region is that at the moment we're very heavily dominated by my own political party, as it happens, but, but not totally. And you would find it very hard to find where the different political leaders disagree with the, with the, the common agreement, because this common view has now got such deep roots. So that matters enormously. But the, but the second factor in this is that we, where we were lucky is that um, during the period of this present Conservative government, as have, most of Grace Manchester is uh, controlled by my party, the Labour Party, but the, the Conservative government, which came into power in 2010, established at a personal level a very strong relationship between um, our finance minister, as was George Osborne, and the local political leadership. Now, that matters enormously because that level of trust between central government and local government mattered because they trusted us to have the intellectual competence um, to deliver the things that, said that central government wanted, but to recognise that actually central government itself was best served by that, by um, agreeing largely on the, um, the strategic parameters that we wanted to operate in, but letting the, the local governmental system get on and, de and deliver. Um, the problem with this is it's, it doesn't necessarily look like this everywhere else, and um, which is why in the end, in my country, I think we, we are moving towards a, a system, well, we have in any case a system of asymmetric governance. And uh, uh, so, but so I've got to say, you've got to start off with competence of, of governance. There's, there's got to be competence. One of the issues around that, though, as, as well, is actually if you underfund localism, if central government chooses to underfund localism, it does have a, an impact on that intellectual capacity. Because, um, as I said before, I think uh, um, uh, one of the things I've seen is that if um, if, if we, in austerity, simply respond to crisis management, it makes it difficult to retain the, the strategic planning base. We get rid of the, 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 the planners, effectively, because they're an expensive luxury. They look long-term. However, you can't afford to get rid of that, that capacity. You can't afford, as well, to get rid, actually, of the historical memory, and that's, that's something else that happens when you go through a large change. Um, historical memory does matter. In, in terms of institutional development. Um, so good governance um, coupled with some degree of, of um, investment in, in competence can lead to trust between the different levels of, of, of government. If that trust is there, we then have the capacity to move towards co-design of the, the processes that we need. Now, um, what is clear, as everybody has said, central government must always um, reserve the things that central government can do better. That's right and proper. Where we need, um, where one size fits all is better. Where we need national standards, then one size is the right way of doing things. But quite often, actually, if we're looking for innovation, um, the um, probably very few Maoists left in, at least all in China. Um, and probably not in much of the rest of the world, but actually a thousand flowers blooming is not necessarily the worst thing to do, as long as we call the failing flowers pretty quickly and let the, let the, the strong blooms become the exemplars for other areas. My city region is probably seen now as being the exemplar, not simply in governance, but in terms of the number of um, programmes of delivery. And I'll give you an example um, in the criminal justice area, actually. One, one of the things that historically been done by central government is um, the control of our, um, our offender management uh, processes. So with women offenders, a lot of women um, go to prison in Britain, rather sadly. We have a very high prison population for quite low-level crimes. Um, uh, and the, one of the things that um, I, I, I said in one of my different roles was that actually this is incompetent because prison is very expensive. Um, nor does it generally address the issues that lead women into that kind of criminal behaviour, which is drugs, alcohol abuse, uh, mental health issues, um, sometimes debt management and such like. Um, so to work in a non-custodial setting in, in Greater Manchester has allowed us to do something significant where re-offending levels have dropped amongst this cohort of would-be women offenders. So that matters. It saves central government money. <coughs> 
The problem comes is that, and this comes back to me and Mark said before, you've got to have a mechanic from those who derive the benefit, which in this sense is central government, who doesn't have to pay for our prisons, um, to incentivise the local government, which is delivering the local systems that make a real difference. So um, there's got to be trust. There's got to be proper resource transfer where, where that makes a difference. There's got to be recognition of, of, um, of, of where competences are stronger at the national, the regional, the local level. Um, and um, there probably, in most societies, is not ever going to be simply one right way of doing it across space. Because actually, if you're talking about spatial differentiation, um, spatial differentiation matters in terms of delivery systems as well. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Tony. Um, we're running out of time, and I'd like to have like I mean, at least a couple of questions in the end. Um, so, could you try to be extremely concise? Maybe I mean, not speak more than two minutes or something like that, even possibly less. Um, Josias, I try. Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, um, I agree. We discussed this issue. In fact, uh, I, I'm, I'm a pragmatic. Uh, uh, King's Commissioner, and, and what we discussed before, to have the balance between national and, and local government and between the national government and the European Union, I think, uh, well, that, that's quite important to balance things. And I think you said you have to invest in uh, the appropriate places where, well, there, there, are, there are really possibilities for growth. Uh, and for, you started with Napoleon and so with, with France, uh, maybe a little bit difficult issue for uh, our, our English friend. But si since I think the, uh, the engine between uh, Germany and France has, has been revived, and if you read the, the, the interesting book anyway of uh, the new French president, and, and one of the paragraphs reconcile different parts of France. There are some really interesting ideas linked to the whole discussion of the cohesion funds for the next budgetary period. Interesting ideas, I think, and hopefully the new Dutch government will take notice of it and not trying to sideline themselves by only discussing the new, the new countries in the European Union. What's happening in Paris and Berlin is quite important. Um, Roberta? Well, just briefly, I think that uh, apart from what was already said, so the, the, the ideal situation would be also a multiscalar uh, approach and governance uh, sometimes, uh, so make the national, European national and local um, uh, levels speak and go together. Um, the point is that uh, we should develop policies where competencies are. Uh, and this, especially at the local level, this can be a problem. Uh, local policy makers uh, have sometimes uh, not the capacity to develop what was, what is, uh, could be, think to be uh, efficient policies. And to get efficient policy at the local level, you, ha you have to be able to develop uh, shared visions and common goals, uh, as I said before, uh, in the case of, the, of innovation. Uh, you have to have also to monitor core priority needs, which is again something extremely difficult uh, in order to be uh, efficient. So uh, my claim, to be short, is that um, the right level sometimes is, has to be First of all, a precondition for the right scale to develop policy is that competencies are settled and are there. Thank you. Thanks so much. Mark? I'll be uh, brief as well, uh, uh, since especially Tony said, I think I said it much better than I could. I mean, what, what you said would apply where I became interested in the most rural parts of Canada. You exactly, described exactly the same issues come up as that. Uh, you, you need leadership, that, that not, just not, not consider their immediate situation, but 20, 30, 40 years down the road, competent, uh, incompetent politicians, policymakers carrying out the best policy will not necessarily lead to the best outcomes anyway. I mean, I, I think it said it really, really well. Uh, in, in terms of how, how, how to do this, I think a lot you know, came up in terms of how to in, 
define regions and, and what would be the proper scale of governance for certain things. You know, I, I would always say that one, don't ever lose sight of the entire labor market uh, slash economic region because that's where economic development should take place. But of course, issues like bike, you know, what bike lanes and so on is certainly not a level at, the, at a regional level. You know, um, but I do want to say though, in terms of doing that, what I've noticed is, is you know, this, a lot of the things that Tony pointed, you know, pointed out is just this lack of trust. You know, you develop these rivalries, like I mentioned rural Canada, where they still remember some, you know, high school hockey game that they played 20 years ago. You know, these things still matter a lot in terms of, you know, local governance arrangements today. And, and, and also what I've noticed is that it's really hard to come from the top and impose reasonable, very well thought out, uh, regional governance from the top down without any buy-in because it will not be implemented correctly. And so, uh, you know, given that, uh, I, I'm just thinking of just certain examples from the province of Ontario or the province of Alberta, with Alberta doing it well, Ontario not, where how, how this matters. And, and, and I think where a key area of research, where I'll just stand, is in, is in a couple areas, is how should higher levels of government, if they want better local governance, regional governance, how should they incentivize it? It's some sort of combination of carrots and sticks. You know, too hard on the stick, force people to do things, They'll just, they'll just, they won't, they won't do it. They'll make it worse off. Uh, likewise, what, what are some of the hard evidence? You know, we, we, you know, like I said, OECD had a wonderful study. I love the study, but, but what it doesn't provide is that. Well, what are the cost savings from doing this? What are the economic development benefits? I mean, it, it wasn't a, a fault of the study. You know, like one study can't do everything. But what I'm saying, you know, a lot of academics here, this is, these are the areas that I think we're really missing right now. We spend too much time on the perfect policy and not enough time thinking about, well, actually, human beings have to carry out this policy. We have to set up the institutions and, provide, and hope they're competent enough to actually do that. So it's kind of a call for research in this because, at least from my point of view, it's extremely important. Okay, well, thanks. Uh, thank you, everybody, for all your, I mean, very, uh, very interesting and, uh, and passionate um, insights you've been sharing with us. I think we started a bit late, so I think we can take a bit extra time and just have, like, one round of questions. So, I mean, um, if you are asking a question, please just say your name and who you are mainly addressing the question to. I'll break the ice. I'm Louis Dijkstra. I work for the European Commission. I had a quick question about scale. We talked a lot about competences of administrative levels and governance. We talked about needing certain expertise. Um, when we have a place like Greater Manchester, obviously this is a large um, city with a lot of competences, with a lot of staff. Um, when it comes to the rural areas, and I was particularly curious to, see, to hear Mark's opinion, um, do we actually need to scale up? Or um, hear from Rudiger about France, are the municipalities in France so small that we can't possibly expect them to do anything that's really complicated? Okay, I mean, let's, let's collect questions and then answer and then go. Uh, can I have some information about well-being? Because uh, uh, I don't, uh, I didn't heard about well-being. So I would like uh, that you say something uh, better about this word. Thanks. Any any more questions? I mean. Lies Allenhoff, Frans Hogeschool Groningen. Just to add, we had a brilliant uh, researcher from Calabria who was very good in nanotechnology and I was indeed very surprised <laughs> that his background, uh, he spent years at university there, but he was really brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> it's the future of Calabria then. <laughs> Okay, then um, you sure no more questions? Last chance? 
Okay, well then maybe then just start from over there and go around this way and just if you want to answer something with the questions or kind of react to something that was said before, briefly. Yep. Thank you. Uh, let me pick up uh, the, the issue of scale, and certainly if you look at uh, urban and rural issues. What I agree with Roberta, it, it's not about scale, it's about place matters, and then you have to find out what are your goals and how to join forces. And if the scale of the participant is too small, there's even more reason to join forces. May I just use one example? I, we try to, to give impulse to the self-driving car. It's necessary if you look upon it from a, a, a point of view of uh, safety, security, but uh, also in terms of trying to achieve the goals we agreed upon in Paris. And we need a cooperation between companies in the United States. We have European uh, cooperation. We have an issue at uh, a UN level, but we also have to find out solutions. How can we achieve that a cow is not hitting a car somewhere a little bit further on from, from Groningen. So you need different levels to find your final answer between public and private partners. But it started agreeing upon the goal and it started, I need a point of interest for every participant he or she wants to achieve. So I like to cooperate with people who know what they want and then we put energy in it, can be money, and then we try to achieve something. And that's what we do, for example, in self-driving cars. But take, for example, the other one, uh, Hyperloop. We try to be up front. And Elon Musk from uh, in the United States wants to start here in the Netherlands. And the reason he wants to do that is a concentration of university knowledge. It's about people. It's about uh, the possibility to adapt new solutions. And it's about a government who is quite clear how to operate. And then you join forces. Uh, we don't have a real necessity to have a hyperloop in the Netherlands, but we like to be partner in development of uh, intelligence and transport. So you join forces. So if you're small, even the reason the more to join forces. Thank you. Roberta? Well, I think um, the, the scale has to be decided in terms of fields of policies. I mean, we, there are fields in which you need a critical mass uh, and also a multi scala decision, uh, infrastructure, transport infrastructure, and so on. Uh, so that's something that where you have to achieve a critical mass, both in terms of decision, design, and then implementation of the policies. There are other situations in which you, you can probably, at a lower scale, uh, my re reply is that it depends on, the, on what policies we are speaking about. So, that's um, a little bit vague at the moment, the, the debate we are doing. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, take an example of the, uh, uh, the cooperation in the, in, in the north. Uh, the uh, cooperation is perfect between three provinces, and it works uh, for the issues we are discussing with the national government and with our neighbors and with Germany as well, perfectly. So, uh, keep it afloat, would be my advice. Yeah, can, can, can I pick up the challenge about well-being, actually? I mean, so, so it's a really good, uh, good question. And uh, I, I guess neither, um, we, we've not normally, as, uh, in, in our society, been particularly good at, um, at, at deciding what well-being begins, begins to look like. Uh, um, we, we don't measure it well. And so, and politicians and maybe academics to an extent like to have tangible outputs that we can measure, three, three tonnes, um, 44 kilometres, whatever it may be. Um, but you're right. I mean, the, the, the goal of any um, re regional strategy, any national strategy in the end ought to be the well-being of the, of, of the population. Um, how you achieve that is probably through, uh, through proxies, but it is about creating um, the kind of places that people want to live in, where the the um, the, the, uh, the environment is is a pleasant environment, where um, there's a good mix of the of the the, th the things in life that aren't simply economic variables, um, <coughs> um, cultural variables, uh, the capacity to walk in the woods, uh, etc. I mean, these are 
are things that um, that, that have become more, more complicated to, uh, um, to to measure. But if, if you're working through those those kind of processes, I guess. I mean, the, w w what I would say are these: there are some preconditions to that, because people who um, are not healthy, people who um, have poor access to education, people who um, uh, spend large parts of their life um, unemployed. I think, generally speaking, most of us would believe tend to find the well-being agenda a little more challenging, um, uh, the, the, and so on. Um, so I think we we do have to get the basic um, the, the basic variables right for people, and maybe the ultimate answer to the well-being question lies. Um, in a very decentralised world, way beyond politicians, way beyond academics, it's about individual choice. But it is the role to make sure that you've got the preconditioned right to to access those uh, those better things in life. Mark, well, uh, uh, I'll, I'll answer the well-being uh, question, but I just want to mention Lewis's question uh, more directly. Very good question. Is that uh, it's been answered in terms of rural, but that is. Uh, I, you know, I gave the academic term, you know, shared agglomeration, you know, in, in, in practical means, I've gone into the rural communities and said, you right now, you do not have the capacity to write a grant to the higher level government to get this road or this water system or this park or improvements to your school because you don't have enough money to hire people who can actually know how to write those grants. And, if, and unless you work together with larger groups so that you have the money to have that kind of capacity, you may have, you may think you have autonomy, but you actually don't because you have no power to actually do anything. You're too small. You need to be big enough to actually, if you want to do something, you can do it. And I think you've really hit upon the question that in rural areas that they, you know, they, they so much want their independence, but in this, this effort to gain independence, they lose all their ability to actually affect their life because they don't have the capacity to do that. They're just too small. In terms of the well-being question, I, I think that's a great question in the sense that, uh, you know, as an economist, I have to re remind students when I teach economics that in economics, when I teach you, I'm not saying we maximize income, we maximize utility, which would be the old word for well-being. And, and in that, I think it was <clears throat> perfectly well stated that if we have a place that, like West Virginia, we might get rid of all coal mining regulations and create a handful of jobs for a few years. But think about it, in 30 years, will anybody ever want to live in such a place? Yes, we created income temporarily, but we made the well-being. Who wants to be there? And in that, in terms of, of, in terms of well-being, but in terms of just building trust, you know, and I'll give it on a Brexit level, but the same kind of things in bringing any group kind of come together. In Brexit, I think, I, I think we could have a universal agreement that joining the European Union created, on average, higher aggregate income in the United Kingdom. What it didn't do was like every economic policy. There's winners and losers. We have to ensure that the winners transfer resources to the losers so that everybody benefits. And that wasn't done, and hence, what, what you know, on an aggregate, is a very good policy because it wasn't carried out well, you know, thinking about well-being, but on the, on the micro level of ensuring everybody could buy into it, it fell apart. The same kind of thing when we talk about these regional governance arrangements, we have to ensure that not everybody's going to benefit from that, even on the aggregate, the pie will be bigger, but ensure their mechanisms, ensure everybody gets better, you know, everybody has, receives uh, transfers so that everybody's better off, thus they'll have more trust in the process to do it. Okay, well, thanks, everybody. Um, just some shameless advertisement. We're having a regional database um, with regional well-being indicators, which are obviously not perfect because the underlying data is often often missing. But I mean, still, it's an effort to measure that, and it's something I think which is very, very useful. Um, what I'll do, I'll try to summarize. I mean, this session in 30 seconds, which is probably impossible. Like, so it's had some incredibly rich sessions. So I'll just kind of like, I mean talk quickly about four points which I think have been coming up again and again. The first one was basically that um, what is really important is that you have partnerships between the national and the local level and that seems to be, I mean, a really kind of like a, a driver for achieving good results and for that one of the important issues is also trust between the different levels. The second issue that came up again and again was also the importance of governance and governance institutions for achieving good outcomes. Um, the third one was that infrastructure is important, but you know, like in, if you remember your times in, in school and mathematics, it's like, it's like a necessary but not sufficient conditions. I mean, it's not helping by itself, so it depends what you do with it, basically, and you need other things as well. And then the fourth point is that, I mean, local competences and capacities are, are really important. And uh, for that, you need a certain minimal size, basically, to be able to achieve them. 
you need trust from above, also to kind of like to be able to develop them, and you also need a certain amount of funding to be able to be able to afford the people who can basically create that capacities at the local level and long term. Um, what remains to me is to thank my fan panel in here. I mean, I think that was a really, really interesting panel. I'm, I'm very, very, I mean, happy with the discussion. So thank you very much. I thought it was very interesting. I hope that you found it as interesting as I did. And thank you very much for your patience because we've been running over a little bit, but I think it was worth it. So let's give a big applause to the panel members. Thank you.